Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for October 22nd, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today by Jim Clausing and John Hugaboom. I'm Brian Rexrode. And Jim, let's talk a little bit about some uh, recent Java updates. Yeah, Brian, uh, last week was Oracle's quarterly update, uh, and so they uh, released uh, updates to Java and their database uh, products and a number of other things. And in particular, though, today I wanted to mention the Java update because that we talk about it on this show all the time, uh, how frequently Java gets targeted. So uh, the 7U45 was released last week, which fixed 51 vulnerabilities, 10 of them uh, rated a 10.0 on the CVSS scale. Um, so these are really serious vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be updating your Java if you're running it. Um, you're, you should probably have been alerted to it, uh, the, the new version being available, but you definitely want to apply this. There are a number of really significant vulnerabilities that are fixed in this one. One of the things I've noticed and we've talked about before, I think, is that uh, sometimes when you do a Java update, it doesn't necessarily delete the old versions of Java. Is this one going to replace what's uh, what's already out there? Yeah, it will replace the uh, previous uh, Java 7 releases. So if you're running Java 7U40 or 7U21 or whatever, um, mm -hmm. should replace that. Now, if you're still... If you still have a, a four, five, or six installation on there, it's not going to do anything with those. Mm -hmm. But it should fix the most recent uh, Java 7 releases. Okay. And just a personal observation here, I noticed that, uh, you know, I got prompted with a pop-up to do the update, which is a good thing. Um, sometimes uh, you have to watch... Uh, Pay, pay a little special attention. I think the first pop-up that I noticed was uh, actually getting permission to make modifications to the system, of course. Anytime you get that, you want to take a close look at uh, making sure that you really do want to give that permission. But then after that, it kind of hid down in the corner and said it wanted to do the actual, actually do the updates. And you have to also acknowledge that before that updates actually uh, start to take place. So there are a few steps involved. If you're not paying attention, you're going to continue to get that update asking if it's okay to make changes on your system. Java Updater isn't one that silently uh, automatically updates in the background. It pops, you, right. pops up telling you that there is an update, but you do need to do a couple of clicks to, to actually let it happen. Exactly, right. You may, you may also want to pay attention. Um, I believe uh, it might ask you to install some additional, like, browser plugins, like the Ask Toolbar and whatnot, which you may or may not want. So you might be mindful of that, that you might want to uncheck that um, if you don't want that installed as part of the upgrade process, because it really doesn't have anything to do with Java. Yeah, those are not related to Java, but uh, I guess part of the, the strategy, you know, Java is provided basically as a piece uh, of um, software that's provided without charge, or and they're, I think they're basically uh, using that as a means to help subsidize the product. So, Next item here, uh, let's see, um, some uh, malware trends here. I guess, Jim, you're going to have to explain this one to me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I happened across this um, report from uh, Trend Micro's uh, Trend Lab's Security Intelligence blog. Um, it actually was uh, probably 10 days ago that I, that I saw it, but um, it was uh, taking note of a couple of, of trends that have been seen in the last few weeks with the malware. Um, the, the first one was the, uh, this um, Shotador or Shotoder, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it, um, but it was a, a technique that a, that a couple of um, a couple of malicious actors have used, where it drops the malicious code in pieces, and then it's got a an auto IT um, script interpreter uh, piece there that will reassemble the the malware 
on the fly in memory, so you, you don't have the entire um, malware executable as a single executable on the disk any place. Mm -hmm. It assembles it in memory and then injects itself into some other running processes as a way to try to you know, try to evade antivirus um, by you know breaking it up into smaller pieces that hopefully evade things. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an interesting trend that I hadn't really um, seen a whole lot of lately, um, but uh, apparently the folks at Trend are seeing more of it uh, in the last few weeks, so I thought it was worth uh, mentioning here. Since you're on the subject, you know, I read a book some time ago, I think it was by an author from Symantec that uh, basically it was a related to malware analysis and, uh, and any virus techniques. I'll have to pull the book out uh, sometime, and I think it's right behind me on the bookshelf. I, I probably got about halfway through the book before I was completely snowed. <laughs> it, it really amazed me. I think, and for, if for no other reason, I think it's worth looking at the book in the sense that it provides some significant insight into how complex or how sophisticated some of these antivirus evasion techniques. You know, the tendency is to be kind of critical that the antivirus uh, tools have not been particularly effective, but the fact is and a, a significant amount of investment has gone into finding ways to evade those, uh, those detection techniques. And I, this is uh, perhaps just another example of the variety of uh, tricks that are being used and make it very difficult to detect a, uh, you know, anything that's malicious in a system that's fundamentally the underlying system has been compromised. So just my little injection there. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. I, the the bad guys have gone to a lot of effort to to try to stay ahead of the good guys, and uh, there's some smart people on that side, unfortunately. I, I was going to also mention, and I was looking for a while you're talking there. I think we had talked about another story um, not so long ago that had similar aspects of. Um, a piece of malware that pulled various components, and separately they didn't really do anything, but once you assembled all the components together, it would make an actual malware executable, um, which sounds similar uh, in, in ways. So, yeah, Well, I, as I was reading this, I was thinking, I thought we had talked about that on the show, uh, or, or you and I had talked about it in another context some, recently. Um, right. I, could, I couldn't find it either, so I... Uh, yeah, and so uh, it, it sounds like this is being used uh, predominantly in a ransomware campaign. Is that correct? Well, no. This this one is actually separate from the the other thing that I wanted to talk about that was also in this uh, Trend Labs report, mm -hmm. which is which is the ransomware uh, thing. In the last oh month, six weeks, there's been a significant outbreak of a, a new ransomware campaign. Uh, this one they're calling Crypto Locker. And uh, what this one does, uh, we've, we've seen them before. You know, you'll have um, malware that will pop something up saying, you know, unless you pay us money, you'll never get back into your computer. Right. And sometimes they actually do encrypt pieces of the, the, of the uh, hard disk and, you know, critical files and so forth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't really even do that. Mm -hmm. um, but this one uh, has been, um, for about the last six weeks or so, it has been a pretty significant um, outbreak of it. And uh, it, does, it does a couple of things. First of all, it uses um, public key encryption, uh, so the key that's on the box that it uses to encrypt the files is not not the key that's going to help you decrypt it, which, you know, and so with some of the previous um, ransomware like this, if it was using symmetric key encryption, the key that was used to do the encrypting is the same key that is used to do the decrypting, and it was located somewhere on the file system. So sometimes you could find that and actually get back your uh, encrypted documents. Right. In this case, they're using uh, public key or you know 
asymmetric key encryption, and the decryption key does not exist on the infected box anywhere, mm -hmm. which is problem number one. Uh, and it hits, what it does is it searches um, all of the uh, mounted file systems, you know, the, um, the C colon, D colon, you know, whatever, um, looking for files with a number of ex uh, extensions, um, including, you know, your typical, your doc, docx, um, you know, ppt, xls, uh, but, uh, but a whole bunch of other ones. I think there are like 35 uh, different file extensions that it looks for. So it, it goes looking for pretty much any document on the, on the system that you might consider important. Mm -hmm. And if you've mounted, you know, a, a, a file share that's, you know, a group share, um, it'll go looking through those too and potentially encrypt uh, encrypt documents on the on the share and then it demands three hundred dollars and uh, or two bitcoins and gives you 72 hours wow <laughs> the claim is after 72 hours they're going to delete the decryption key off their server and then right. you're out of luck there's nothing and uh, who knows right well that's uh that's actually quite interesting and so that's actually in itself I think you alluded to this uh, showing the evolution of this kind of um, uh, this kind of malware. You know, there's kind of the good side and the bad side of this, and it's not a very good good side, but, uh, you know, in some infections or a lot of the ones that we've talked about, we tend to think about where uh, there's some type of a data theft or something going on in the background or some other persistent infection. Um, it's very difficult to know that's the case. The one thing with the ransomware is uh, they're going to tend to tell you that you're infected, and so you, at least you know, uh, although they probably aren't telling you until really kind of in a bit of a predicament here. And um, so I guess a couple of things that we want to uh, kind of keep in mind. Well, first of all, as you've mentioned before, the, the evolution has kind of been in the past, they didn't necessarily even encrypt things. They just kind of made it so it was, uh, they might have hidden things, you know, kind of screwed up the directory structure or something, and the, the data may have actually still been there and, and recoverable uh, the next, because we have to kind of consider actually reading all the data from your system, rewriting those files in an encrypted form or, or even deleting them, it takes a lot more work than just kind of uh, messing around with the, uh, with the directory structure. Uh, but that does make it recoverable, and then they've evolved to the point where they're actually encrypting the files and being selective about which, one they, which ones they encrypt. So uh, that kind of shows an evolution of the activity, and you mentioned the change in the key management, the symmetric, and then going to a public key. and not having the opportunity to, uh, to recover those. Uh, but I guess the other thing is you're pointing out is that if you're using a, uh, an external drive as your backup, you have to be sensitive to that fact as well because you may be actually um, um, you know, losing <laughs> the, the ransomware may actually encrypt your backup as well and you may be in a predicament in that way. So we haven't talked much about how to do backups in the past um, you know, perhaps that's something we need to uh, think about a little bit about how you protect your backups from one of these types of scenarios. That is, that is your really your best recovery option. Yeah, well, in this in this particular instance, um, over on bleepingcomputer.com, uh, they've got virus, spyware, and malware removal guides. And their crypto locker guide actually has got some really good information in it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it points out that the, this particular um, infection, it usually is executing something out of the, um, the user's app data, one of the subdirectories of their app data directory. Mm -hmm. If you're on Windows 7, it's application data if you're still on XP. And um, so one of the ways that they suggest for Potentially protecting it is a you know group policy that prevents um, execution of executables located under the app data directory. That has the potential side effect is some applications that do automatic updates drop their own update in there and then execute the updater from there. Um, but there are ways of of working around that. 
But one of the other interesting things that they noted is um, if you're running um, Vista, uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, um, potentially even uh, XP Service Pack 2 or later, um, there may be ways of getting the old copies of the files back even if you don't have a good backup off the system someplace. Um, we've We've talked uh, occasionally uh, on this program about things like the volume shadow copies um, with Windows 7. And the, one of the things that they suggest in there is assuming you've got it turned on so it's actually doing the periodic um, shadow copies of your you know, whatever uh, drive you're keeping your documents on. Mm -hmm. There are some, some built-in ways that you can potentially get back older copies of your documents that way. Um, the, but some interesting stuff. I, I recommend that folks uh, take a look at it, um, especially if they've seen any of the crypto locker showing up in their enterprise. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think this is one of these things that, uh, at least for me, um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about, you know, what is a good backup strategy that is going to help protect you against these types of things. I can imagine cases where um, the, uh, the attackers would be, you know, trying to retain the same file names or even the appearance that the file has not been disrupted but in the process be actually encrypting and making it unaccessible. And maybe perhaps even fooling the backup system into, you know, replacing your backup with the uh, the encrypted version of it, obviously that's going to uh, would be a bad thing. So you want to start thinking through uh, what kind of strategies the attackers could be using, and uh, what kind of a backup strategy you would be able to uh, basically uh, avoid that sort of thing from happening. You know, making sure that um, modified files aren't um, are getting back backed up without uh, reflecting also other changes that uh, that you would expect to see. So. Uh, interesting uh, and intriguing uh, discussion there, Jim. Thank you. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about the evolution and the ideas that uh, the malicious actors are, are implementing, and so the good guys have good ideas as well. And, uh, John, I guess uh, you have a few things from the Google Ideas Summit that look pretty interesting. Yeah, so we've been looking at, uh, well, there's this, um, a summit that uh, the Google Ideas Think Tank is basically their think tank. They're having a summit this week in New York, and um, uh, the, the subject of the summit is conflict in a connected world, and it's basically kind of surrounding the idea of, um, you know, one in three people live in a country where there's censorship or, you know, active blocking of network activity, internet, you know, accessibility to the internet. So they're looking into ways to, um, you know, improve uh, freedom of speech, uh, reduce censorship in, in these countries that, um, you know, might be engaged in that kind of activity. Uh, and out of this summit, there's uh, three particular initiatives that they're talking about, which are kind of interesting. So I kind of wanted to point them out. The first one is uh, Project Shield. And this is basically Google, and right now it's an invite-only type of thing. You can go to their, web page, or their website, the Google Ideas uh, website, uh, get more information about it. And uh, what this is is they're looking for human rights organizations, uh, other types of organizations like that, that might come under DDoS attack. They actually gave a really good example in their video demonstration of this, um, talking about the Project Shield, in that uh, in Syria, uh, there was a lot of uh, SCUD attacks from the government uh, against, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, the rebel forces, whatnot. And they uh, actually had put together, uh, the good guys in this case, or the rebels, I guess, had put together a website that would allow um, very rapid um, information about where these missile attacks were going to occur so people who had access to the Internet could uh, get information, know that, you know, a missile attack might be occurring and they can go to a safe area where they could um, be protected. So the government... Air raid sirens. Right, right. It's a, yeah, a high-tech air raid siren, basically. So um, uh, I guess the government of Syria was not particularly happy about this, so there were some DDoS attacks going on against that website uh, to prevent, you know, them knowing that kind of thing. So that's the type of... Um, 
that's the type of website that they're looking to on-ramp onto this um, uh, Project Shield. And basically what it does is it's uh, Google's basically their own version of a content distribution network, similar to Akamai and whatnot. It allows you to host your website via Google's uh, infrastructure, which is very robust um, and very diverse, so it, it's very difficult to be DDoS. And uh, so right now they're looking at, um, you know, looking for trusted testers on an invite-only type of basis to, to trial this out. And, you know, ultimately they might look into um, using that in a, a wider service offering to more than just, um, you know, a limited distribution of people. Good idea. Uh, the, uh, the second one is a kind of a parallel type of uh, uh, initiative, and it's the digital attack map. This is kind of a cool... It's actually animated. This particular um, chart is static because I had to take a screenshot. If you go to the website, um, this is a partnership with Arbor Networks, um, and it's very similar. I believe it's the same type of data set you get from Arbor's Atlas service, if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, but it's another visualization, and it allows you to step through uh, time day by day and kind of see what attacks were going on and what the Arbor uh, data set was picking up in terms of attack traffic, where it was from, and to. Um, and the amounts of traffic, the types of traffic, if it's a DNS reflection attack or a TCP SYN flood. Uh, so there's some interesting data around there, and you can kind of see uh, where most of the attacks are occurring, who's being attacked most, where they're originating from. You can see uh, the United States is a little bit of a hot spot on this particular chart uh, uh, for the day in question that I was looking. I think in general it's mostly um, uh, shows a lot of U.S., but that also might reflect, you know, Arbor's um, customer base. Uh, as well a little bit in that, um, but um, it's an interesting uh, map and they have a lot of tunables and you can tweak it and kind of navigate through the different types of data that's available there. So this is a, this is a map by country because I noticed that the, uh, the United States isn't actually showing in the center of the country. Perhaps that's just a... Right. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's... Uh, I believe it's by country. I don't think it's really the Northeast that's being engaged there in terms of this activity. Um, but, uh, right, it's a country-by-country country type of thing. Okay. And they actually have a key. I couldn't show all of it here, but the different types of circle, like a circle is a, um, you know, it's an in-country attack, so it's United States sources attacking United States destinations, whereas these spans that go out um, might be unknown, and then the arcs that actually land somewhere um, kind of show you the from and to destinations of where the sources and attack, or sources and destinations are in the attack. Got it. So it's interesting. Um, and there, there's a lot more tunables below that I couldn't show on the screen in this one screenshot, but it's an interesting website to go check out. And you can also get a table version of text and kind of get more details um, instead of just looking at it in a visual uh, world map view. Okay. So this isn't necessarily describing anything about the motivation. It's just the fact that no. it takes place. Yeah, and a lot of uh, – well, all of the data is anonymized uh, that's in there, so you don't really have good information around who who's attacking and who's being attacked other than the countries that they're in. So, um, you know, but it gives you some kind of idea of how much DDoS activity is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one uh, is another interesting initiative. It's, it's um, a browser extension, and this is in partnership with University of Washington and uh, Brave New Software. And, uh, it, you know, in conjunction with the Google Ideas team. And um, it's uh, uProxy is a browser extension that's for uh, Chrome, of course, and Firefox. And it's similar in ways to Tor, but on a, maybe a light scale. And what it allows you to do is, you know, you can set up at home uh, to share your Internet connection so that when you are traveling, uh, remotely and whatnot, you can set this uProxy browser extension up in your maybe your laptop that you travel with, and when you're in a coffee shop, you can actually route your traffic from the coffee shop to home in an encrypted manner, and then it will, you know, proxy it from home to wherever you're actually trying to get to. So that helps in terms of protecting your data um, in transit so that people can't sniff it or sniff what you're doing um, on the wire. And they also, I guess, have engineered it so that, um, you know, you might be able to build like a, a network of friends, of trusted friends that you have and use their uProxies and kind of have a, a little network of uh, proxies that you could use, not just your own if you wanted as well. Um, 
So similar in tour, but maybe on a more friend, peer-to-peer -peer type of relationship that you would set up as opposed to a completely anonymized uh, proxy type service. Um, and as far as I understand, it's only in your browser that it would um, really work. But most people, that's what they're doing. They're using their browser to maybe, you know, when they're, um, when they're traveling to get to their email, webmail, and things like that. So if I understand correctly, you're setting up a, basically a proxy link to your own basically hosted proxy from your sort of base home Internet connection. Is that right? Right, right. And, and so the, uh, the connection from wherever you happen to be, if you're on, you know, in a, uh, uh, some place where they have free Wi-Fi, uh, you have an encrypted connection from there to your proxy. Mm -hmm. So I presume it's protecting, you know, when you visit a site, Making sure that you can't be your activity on that Wi-Fi connection can't be sniffed by other, perhaps nefarious folks that are on that Wi-Fi connection. But in addition, it's kind of hiding where you're actually sitting. So perhaps uh, hiding the fact that you're on the road. Uh, probably yes. And you know, you could see, you know, in the U.S., we don't have freedom of speech issues here. Um, so we're, you know, it, it would obfuscate where you're coming from and protect your, your uh, data in transit, but there are probably countries where this would be very useful if they had friends in other countries that don't have such restrictions They might be able to set up arrangements like this so that they can access websites that they wouldn't normally be able to. Um, and it would probably be a little bit more robust than some of those open proxies that, you know, we've seen out there that you know, they get so much traffic, they're usually very slow, and, um, you know, if you had a friend-to-friend -friend type of situation, it might be a little bit more, uh, a little, more, a little uh, peppier than those ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. My, my personal solution to surfing when I'm on a, you know, hotel network or a, <clears throat> or a open Wi-Fi, you know, at a coffee shop or whatever, is to have an open VPN tunnel back to my system at home and I've got my own squid proxy at home. Uh, but that takes, you know, some setup and that's fine for somebody like me, but I'm not sure that uh, if I hadn't set it up for my wife and daughter, I'm not sure that they'd be able to set it up on their own. This sounds like it might be a little simpler to set up. So. Mm -hmm. But a very similar solution apparently. Yep. In concept. Very neat. And uh, I guess obviously you still have to be mindful, I, you know, considering that perhaps one of the motivation is to hide the fact that you're on the road. Um, you still have to be mindful that any location information from a device you're using or something like that could also be uh, transferred. So some apps, for example, would be uh, <laughs> would would perhaps go right through that. Although this appears to perhaps be limited to Chrome and Firefox at this point. Is that right, John? Yeah, right now it is limited to Chrome and Firefox, although they are considering, it says that they're considering mobile devices and maybe other browsers in the future. So, mm -hmm. uh, Again, some good ideas there. Okay. So, uh, thank you, John. And uh, so let's take a little bit of a philosophical view of things. And, uh, Jim, how do we distinguish passwords from usernames? <laughs> Uh, yeah, this was an interesting blog post. I just happened across it this week. It's a couple weeks old. Um, you know, we've talked about using biometrics as a replacement for, um, you know, for passwords and stuff. That people talk about that all the time. But um, Dustin Kirkland here, who's uh, actually is a works for Canonical, the folks that put out Ubuntu. Um, had an interesting take on it that got me thinking a, a little bit. Uh, you know, the title of his blog post is "Fingerprints Are Usernames, Not Passwords." Um, and you know, the the issue that I've always had with biometrics is if it gets compromised, you know, how do you change it? Um, and so his his thought was that it should be used um, more for uh, identity and you know, and not for um, Authentication, and uh, which, you know, which, like I said, it, it got me thinking because most of the time when people talk about the biometrics, it's as a replacement for passwords, which is you know the authentication piece. Um, so, I don't know. I, I I tend to agree with a lot of the things he said in there, but it, it just was interesting. I hadn't really thought about it in quite those terms before. Mm -hmm. But throw it out there. Yeah, so perhaps a little bit on the extreme, but um, 
you know, kind of, kind of making a point through perhaps just a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> you aren't necessarily, um, you know, open about sharing your biometric information like you might be associated with a uh, with a username. But at the same time, it's uh, it drives the point home. Your your point being that it's very difficult to change biometrics. I wouldn't say impossible. There are a lot of things that can be done with scalpels these days, and um, and so that's uh, one of the things we. <laughs> You know, it would be uh, unfortunate if you have to, uh, and perhaps this is a business opportunity for surgeons to be saying, hey, we'll, we'll change your biometrics for you if you've been compromised. Yeah, well, the other point that he makes in here, and we actually made it a couple of weeks ago on this, on the show when we were talking about the, you know, the fingerprint reader um, and stuff, is, you know, the fact that you leave your fingerprints everywhere. You, on your mobile devices, it's, it's everywhere. You know, um, and so, you know, something that's everywhere is not necessarily a a good choice for, you know, authentication. Mm -hmm. And so that was another of the points that he made in here that I actually tend to kind of agree with. Yep. Uh, as you as you stated in introducing this, uh, it's an interesting thought, and I think uh, really uh, worth uh, putting some, uh, you know, some thought into uh, what I'd like to share with you here today is an article from SureWorks that was uh, describing, uh, I think there, we may have even discussed this, uh, perhaps we didn't, but uh, with the recent arrest of the uh, alleged author of the Black Hole Exploit Kit, uh, that one of the large user communities or large users associated with that exploit kit has uh, transitioned over to a different exploit kit called Magnitude. Um, but I thought it equally as... Uh, uh, insightful or interesting about this was how that was actually being done. So in this HearWorks article, uh, they refer to the Cutwall spamming botnet that is apparently being used for uh, distributing these exploits. And uh, what was interesting to me was actually the payloads that they were referring to. Uh, there were actually two payloads. One, the game over Zeus Trojan, which is oftentimes associated with, um, with bank fraud activity or uh, financial fraud. And then uh, along with that, they mentioned the zero access uh, Trojan, which is associated with, uh, generally associated with click fraud. And uh, we've reported on a number of occasions associated that basically the zero access botnet. And, you know, that kind of has uh, hides in the background on uh, users' machines, uh, may not be noticed very readily. And uh, a lot of the activity that's associated with it is not affecting the end user directly. I think they also do some Bitcoin mining as well. Again, not having a direct impact on the victim. And so uh, we've uh, sort of downplayed it a little bit. But when we associate this Cutwell botnet with distributing both the game over as well as the uh, zero access, I don't know if for a fact uh, they're distributing both of those payloads on the same machines, but it does uh, sort of raise the level of concern. That is, if you're a zero access victim, you may also potentially be a uh, game over Zeus Trojan victim. So uh, I think that raises the stakes a little bit in terms of the uh, concern around the zero access botnet. And uh, along those lines, uh, we've been reporting recently how the zero access botnet has had uh, somewhat of a revival, actually <laughs> very clearly a revival since around the beginning of September uh, grown significantly to, I think, at least as uh, as strong as it had ever had been. And I'm showing here basically the peer-to-peer the -peer activity associated with the zero-access botnet. So uh, the potential that these may be combined with um, uh, the game over Zeus Trojans as well uh, raises, a, I guess, at least a significant concern in my mind, and uh, hopefully uh, folks will... Uh, be taking a look at that. I know certainly we will be taking a closer look to see if there are signs of uh, crossover associated with that. So uh, a few points there. You know, the zero access may have some other uh, implications associated with it. Cut whale botnet, I wasn't actually particularly aware that, the, uh, that that was in the business of distributing malware associated with the zero access botnet. I was kind of wondering about that previously. And then on top of that, the uh, transition from the black hole exploit kit to the uh, magnitude exploit kit uh, sort of indicating that there every, is every intention of evolving beyond the rest of the uh, author, of, the budget author of that uh, black hole exploit kit. 
You know, the thing I think is interesting, well, first of all, um, uh, we, we do see on a regular basis spam emails and some of our spam analysis that are distributing um, zero access. So I never really tried to correlate it back to cut whale, uh, but that probably is the case here. Um, maybe we should go back and do some, you know, deeper analysis of some of those uh, spams that we've seen. The other interesting aspect, I think, is that, you know, both Game Over, the Zeus Game Over, and um, Zero Access are both peer-to-peer -peer based uh, botnets for their command and control, uh, which is, there's probably some reason they're bundling those together. Uh, Zero Access is a lot easier to pick out on the network because it uses static destination ports um, for its peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, whereas Game Over doesn't. Um, so I find that interesting. I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, I kind of suspect that maybe the game over part is for the credential um, theft and, yep. you know, maybe some identity and criminal activity in that regard, whereas the uh, zero access might be to do some extra monetization. Since we got your machine anyway, we're going to get it engaged in some click fraud and keep it busy generating revenue even while, you know, um, maybe we're trying to do something with your stolen login IDs and passwords. Mm -hmm. So. Um, seems like they're covering all aspects, whoever's uh, distributing that. Mm -hmm. Now, I can only speculate on some of these things, but clearly um, or there's certainly the opportunity that, or the, you know, the possibility that there is a collaboration activity of different groups here. So the Cutwell botnet basically being a distribu uh, an exploit distribution botnet, they're able to uh, exploit machines, uh, gather inventory of that, and then distribute it among potential users of which the Game Over Zeus users may in fact be a different consumer of that, basically the product, so to speak, uh, being infected machines, may in fact be a different consumer from the zero access. And like I said, we don't really have a good assessment of uh, how much overlap exists between those two, whether it's a strong overlap, or maybe they're even completely exclusive of each other. But um, again, it's, uh, it's considering those possibilities that, uh, that are significant. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, John. Good insights. Uh, I have an abbreviated um, insight into uh, basically Internet weather activity for the last week or so here. Uh, one is an observation of an increase in terms of scanning activity or scan flows on port 5223 TCP. And, uh, you know, this particular port happens to be associated with Apple iChat. That it's, um, I don't think it's officially registered to that port, but uh, it has been used for that. And uh, most of the sources associated with that, this activity are associated with mobility subscribers. And the destinations are actually associated with a fairly well-known uh, cloud service provider. So the combination of those things tells me that this is probably not malicious activity, but uh, it is one thing that um, you know, has showed up recently. It's a fairly abrupt and uh, consistent increase in activity. Uh, it's not ramping up. In fact, it seems to have uh, basically stabilized. So it could be just sort of a change of infrastructure or new application that's come out. Uh, we'll be taking a look at that a little bit more closely to make sure there's no malicious activity associated with that. Uh, there weren't any other significant observables, although, you know, we report many times there are, uh, you know, denial of service attacks that are continuing. We're going to take a little closer look at that. And uh, so with that, we'll take a look at the uh, most probed ports here. And uh, as we've been reporting, there seem, is continuing an increase in the proportion of uh, activity associated with probes on uh, port 53 UDP. Uh, this is actually showing a relatively, uh, uh, basically a shift in the DNS reflection attack activity. That is what we're seeing is a, a larger proportion of the queries that are, uh, are showing up in our analysis. Uh, as you can see, obviously, uh, taking up a significant proportion of this pie chart here, about a third of it anyway. And uh, we continue to see uh, the port 445 activity. Port 80 TCP is showing up on the list here, and port 3389 showing up on the list. Oh, pardon me, I overlooked the uh, port uh, 1433 TCP as well, uh, just behind the uh, 445 TCP. And then we also see, obviously, the peer-to-peer -peer ports associated with the uh, zero access botnet that we just talked about. Now, in terms of the most sources doing the probing, uh, again, port 445 at the top, and uh, port 80, as we just mentioned, and port 3389 are showing up there, as well as, again, the port of the peer, peer activity associated with the zero access botnet. 
Uh, taking a look at the reconnaissance index, again, as I mentioned with the, uh, the increase in the number of uh, probes on port 53 EDP, again, those are uh, generally associated with queries to uh, conduct DNS reflection attacks. They also get picked up as scanning activity. Uh, this is, again, showing that uh, that large amount of activity, that increase in the general reconnaissance index uh, that is attributable to um, these DNS reflection attacks. And uh, with that, uh, here's an another perspective of that activity. Uh, this is DNS reflection attack activity, or basically a summary of that activity from October 21st, yesterday. And uh, I'm showing two perspectives here. One is the number of sources by query name and type. Uh, so what we're basically showing here is that based on, across the bottom here, a variety of queries, and I've kind of masked out a piece of this, uh, each of these queries is a unique query. And uh, so you can see that there are some of them that are, have a significant number of sources associated with those DNS reflection attacks. So uh, here's one that's actually well in excess of uh, 53,000 sources that, that is, these queries were spread out to many DNS servers, and we observed at least 53,000 or so sources that were responding to those queries and participating in attacks. Uh, there's another one over here that was um, on the order of about 48,000 sources that responding to the attacks. And then there are other ones that are well into, you know, they're around 5,000 or so, and you know, some of them are smaller. So that's just the activity from one uh, particular day. And then uh, similarly looking at attacks in terms of the number of a target targets by query name and type. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, there are some attacks where we've seen many different targets, literally in this particular case, just using this one query type, 300 plus uh, target addresses that were, uh, that were being attacked by these DNS reflection attacks. Uh, here's another one with, that was in excess of uh, about, uh, let's see, about 160 or so targets uh, through the course of the day. And then um, over here on the order of about 100 or maybe 120 or so, uh, targets that were that were a target of attack. So, again, just another uh, perspective of looking at this activity. That is uh, clearly there are some trends in terms of the queries that are being used associated with these uh, attacks. And um, so, one of the things that you can use to help protect yourself as well as protect others is get an idea of the frequency of queries that you're seeing in your DNS servers, and uh, perhaps there are some of those that deserve to be. Uh, uh, rate limited or, or throttled at least or perhaps even blocked. So that's the show for today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, as always, you can get in touch with us through email uh, at threattrack at list.att.com. Uh, you can also get in contact with us through Twitter. Our handle is at threattrack. Uh, threattrack video is available on the ATT Tech channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe to the audio-only version of this program also on iTunes. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim and John. I'm Brian Rickstrove. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe.